Hello and welcome to what can only be described as the back of my van, where I've taken up refuge after having spent all of my money on this pilot episode. Fingers crossed that by the time you're seeing it, somebody will have bought it, and in the next episode, you'll see me in some sort of a building. But enough about my financial peril, you're here for dirt bikes, and dirt bikes are the one thing I still have left to me in this world. And where better to begin than with the very birth of the sport, hair scrambling. People have been racing motorbikes since before the First World War, but the first official hair scramble didn't take place until the 29th of March 1924, where 80 riders showed up to duke it out across 30 miles of English countryside. They were practically riding road bikes, and the course was so tough that only 13 finished, one of them describing it as a rare old scramble, and the name stuck. Jeff Smith was the eventual winner, but the real success story was the format. In fact, it's still hotly contested to this day. This is the Acherby's 4 Hour, one of the biggest events on the New Zealand racing calendar. Uh, just beat BG really, show him uh, how to ride these cross country tracks, he reckons he's trying to go me in the first lap, so come and leading, I'll be happy. What was the game plan after that one? Hand over to my partner and uh, <laughs> let him take the reins. <laughs> What's your game plan? My game plan is all I care about is getting to that uh, first turn first. Are you going to put hit in on BG when he comes fast? He's got a bit of size on me to be fair. <laughs> but I put my shoulder and I think I might be alright. Back myself away right, against him. He's suited up three hours before kickoff. Have a look at this. Three hours till race start. This guy's f He's even got his gloves on. Has he got his boots on? I don't know what the go is with that. <laughs> to be fair, I've got my helmet on and it's still cut an hour and a half to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think my speed will be better than all of those riders. Uh, it'll just obviously be the difference in time. I'll spend four hours on the bike and they'll only be out there for two. So um, the body's going to fatigue um, a lot more than them, obviously. Uh, yeah, we'll just see what we can do. Like I say, just try and um, be smooth, probably stand up lots uh just to try and save as much energy as i can and uh yeah just hope that that we come away with the win um game plan i don't know but game yeah plan. well i'm doing the start so go out get a good start put down a heater and then paul's going to take over the reins from there and keep us in front and and hopefully hang on to that lead that Callan's established yeah yeah i suppose just get a good start and just try and yeah uh put in some quick laps after that and Go. See how we go. Yeah, go slightly faster than everyone else, if that's achievable. Ah, uh, you, you could say I have many thoughts on people that do it as a team, but if they want to do it as a team, you know, and then uh, say that they really beat me at the race, they didn't really beat me. Um, yeah, they're pussies. But anyway, that's just my opinion. He's just scared and he's trying to act tough. He knows he knows he's got got a few people out there today. Come race me at the Tarawera when you're ready, mate. Trash talking in the books, the 200 strong field made their way down to the start line where all eyes were on turn one in preparation for the dead engine shotgun start. A 10 second delay here would mean the difference between rounding that corner in first place or last, and that simply wasn't an option because the Taupo region was in a drought and dust would render passing 200 riders completely impossible. It was imperative that your bike fired into life on the first kick. Ben got off to a shocking start. Callan, Brad and Tom, only average ones.
first lap carnage here Scramble Racing is famous for was in full swing, amplified by the dust as the riders rounded the 30 km course and reached the pits. Teams had to go through here every lap to tag their teammates, but Brad as an Ironman could miss it out on the laps where he didn't need to stop for fuel. In one fell swoop he went from third place to the lead, and the hunter had become the hunted. When a former world motocross champion says it's terrible out there, that means it's no joke. And the race was only just getting started. Paul wasted no time in catching second place, Reese Lister, but in the tight trees he was unable to make a pass, and when the track finally did open up again, he was forced to back off for the dust, all allowing Brad to run away up front. Out front, Brad was getting into lap traffic, which was bad news for him, because being the first bike through, he'd be catching the lappers off guard, which meant they were more likely to get in his way and slow him down than the riders coming through after him. It was crucial that he kept a cool head and charged when he had clear track, because Cullen and Paul were putting in a flurry of fast lap times behind him. Brad was tiring, making more and more mistakes. He was also growing complacent, unaware of how small his lead had grown, until he looked over his shoulder and saw Paul right on his rear wheel. He was in big trouble. But you don't become a multi-time national champion without having a few tricks up your sleeve, so he hatched a plan to use the dust berms like smoke grenades, blinding Paul in showers of the stuff. And it worked. 
He entered the pits with enough of a margin to maintain the lead going into the final lap, but only just. It was anyone's race. Right on your ass, Brady, just down three. And this time Callan would be on the receiving end of one of Brad's special dust storms. Could he weather it or would he fold? We were about to find out. <laughs> It came down to the last lap, but in the end there was no beating Brad. As an Ironman, he outclassed all of the teams with consistently fast lap times and minimal mistakes. An incredible display of skill, grit and determination. Cullen and Paul came home in a close and well-deserved second place. Good job, man. That. A couple of big holes, man. How tough was that, Brad? Oh, dude. Brutal there, eh? Four and a half hours, man. Good job. Somebody give me a beer. <laughs> Yes, incredible stuff. Going flat out around a track that rough for four hours is one hell of a physical feat. But it's not only hard on the riders, it's hard on the bikes too. And the more eagle-eyed among you might have noticed that those bikes were a bit different to the ones the guys in the 1920s were riding. Unlike the race format, they have come a long way. And Kawasaki have just bought out a brand spanking new one. So let's get up close and personal with it and try to understand the technology that allows these athletes to push the limits for that long. So, here it is, the biggest update Kawasaki have made to their KX450 since it came out in 2006. It's all new from the ground up, and there really is no two ways about it. It doesn't look that great. That exhaust, I say exhaust, it's really more of a chimney isn't it? And the way that mudguard kind of curves down, it gives the bike a bit of an old fashioned look. Weirdly though, I kind of like that. It tells me that this is a high performance machine. Looks were low on the list of priorities during its development. A bit like Susan Boyle, for example. Except it's still a damn sight better looking than Susan Boyle. All right then, it's a performance oriented machine. We've established that. So how well does it perform? Let's find out. Very well is the answer to that question. The entire engine has been reworked by the maniacs at Kawasaki's World Superbike team. The same people that bought us the 400km per hour Ninja H2R, the fastest production bike ever made. And that's all with everything, from the engine casings to the throttle body, the piston, the cams, the exhaust. They've even moved the entire shock absorber over to one side to improve the angle of the air and fuel intake by just 10 degrees. And they've incorporated some of their superbike wizardry too, in the form of a finger follower valve train. Absolutely no idea what it does or how it works, but it's in there and it sounds very impressive. It's not a widow maker though. All of that extra power is delivered in this incredibly smooth power curve. 
because the maniac engineers understand that horsepower is practically redundant unless you can put it to the ground which is also where the new suspension comes into play Kawasaki have taken a leaf out of Yamaha's book here bucking the trend of lightweight but crap air forks and going back to a traditional spring fork a lot heavier but at least they work in fact these ones in particular really work inside they're essentially Showa A kit forks which might not sound very impressive until you consider that to buy a set of Showa A kit forks on their own would set you back 10 grand how the hell have they done that? And there's more good news too. Gone are the days of hammer and punch sag adjustment. On this it's just an Allen key. And it's got a hydraulic clutch too, look at that. First Japanese bike to have one of those though. It's not actually that impressive because KDM have had them already for about 5 million years. And another thing KDM have had already for about 5 million years, an electric start. But crucially, a lithium ion battery powered electric start that makes use of something called an automatic centrifugal decompression system. No idea, but the effect is monumental. Have a look at this. I've never encountered a high compression four stroke that starts like that. It's just incredible. It's light too. 110 kgs to be precise, making it the lightest of all the Japanese bikes. Still 5 kgs heavier than the equivalent KTM, but we'll gloss over that for now. They've made massive leaps and bounds in the chassis department too. It's one of the most natural feeling bikes I've ever ridden. It doesn't feel as though I'm riding a bike so much as it does I'm throwing one out of my arms and legs. The communication I'm getting through the handlebars and from the foot pegs the sense of exactly where the wheels are and how much grip they've got at any given moment. It's almost telepathic. And the brakes, my god, it's got the biggest rear rotor ever fitted to a production bike. And the feel you've got with all that stopping power is just immense. Unfortunately, however, we've reached the part of the film where I tell you that it's not perfect. But it's not that not perfect. Let me explain. Just little niggly things. Accessing the airbox, for example, a three second tools free job on a KDM, whereas on this it'll take you 30 seconds just to find an 8mm and a 10mm to undo the two different sizes of bolt holding the airbox together. Why? It just seems so obvious to me to have a tools free airbox. Accessing it is something you do between every ride. And that's not all. Want to fit your favourite set of aftermarket handlebars? Well, you can't because it's got skinny handlebar clamps. And to change the engine map, you have to physically change these little color-coded things where it's just a button on the handlebars on most other manufacturers. And to customize a map, forget about it. You need this big bulbous green thing and a whole bunch of cables and a PhD and unnecessarily complicated shit. Yamaha just have an app. Why can't they just have an app? How hard can it be to make an engine map app? I'll admit, I'm nitpicking. Ultimately these are problems that you could live with, and they certainly don't revoke the fact that Kawasaki have ended a streak of mediocre motorcycles with what is invariably a great package. So what, it looks a bit old fashioned and the exhaust resembles a chimney more than it does an exhaust. When it goes, stops and handles like this, who cares? To me this bike represents the rope-a-dope. After being beaten against the ropes for 7 rounds, Kawasaki have come off them in the 8th to knock the competition flat on their backs against all the odds in a big way. Yes, that is one hell of a machine. And one hell of a review if I do say so myself. So good in fact that I think after all of that hard work, I deserve a holiday. So that's what I'm going to do. It's the blackout, Rory got the back out, showing my black ass, engine in the glass house.
Don't start it in a crack house Obama went the back route Kill Bin Laden Another four up in the black house Still got the max out Pull a mask down like a mascot Still drink with bitches I would money her with ass shots Good had room for one more I took the last spot Re-up gang Peter The indicator hit the jackpot Trouble on my mind I do for you big daddy. Jeff, get a message out to the boys. Tell them to meet me at the Pack and Save car park at 8am. We're going on an adventure. You got it, you above averagely handsome lad. Okay, it's 7.59 in the morning after the night before in the pack and save car park. Boys should be here any minute. There we go, this looks promising. There you go mate. You alright? Good Shit. to see ya. Put it there mate. What's going on boys? Good to see ya. How many more cars are we waiting on? Yeah, we're gonna meet Jack at um, McDonald's Mochawaka. Alright. Yeah, and that's it. That's it? Yeah. So we're ready to roll. Pretty, pretty much. Alright. Time to hit the road. Only it wasn't that simple. Come on lights, I've got a skits adventure to go on. No time to waste. As you can plainly see, I was very anxious to get cracking. And with good reason too. On this adventure we'd encounter perilous river crossings that eat vehicles of all sorts alive. Dead bikes left, right and centre, seagulls, seals, sand dunes and vistas beyond counting that make you uncomfortable in your pants. Oh. All that lay ahead. For now though, we were headed to McDonald's. Give me a rundown on the 450X. After holding us up for 15 minutes and failing to finish his breakfast, Jack promptly selected first instead of reverse when exiting the car park. What the f <coughs> And after taking the piss out of Lenny's bike while he was fueling up... What's this thing in here? I don't have one of those. Oh, it's a carburetor. Yeah, no, that's old school, mate. <laughs> I decided to smash my front bumper on the ground. Whoa. Well, that was a f up. And we were on our way. Tell me about this, the KDM free ride. It's Would you agree? Yep. <laughs> After getting that important piece of footage, the passing scenery started to become pretty spectacular. And before long, the tar seal gave way to gravel, where it became absolutely breathtaking. Kynan took one for the team and closed the gate, only there was no post to close it to. But we didn't have time to ponder this because Jack had decided that he had too much tread on his tyres. Ha <laughs> ha! 
Jesus! Have you ever seen anything so hopeless in your life? <laughs> Run away, Diesel. Have you ever seen a me, Jack, that was nice. Everyone's Lennox. I reckon that's pretty pretty low compared to what it was like when I was last time here. Yeah? Uh, I reckon it's going to be pretty slippery. Um, I'll get a close up shot of the rear wheel. Yeah, no, make sure you get a close up now. Yeah, quite, he's going for it. Despite being the only one of us towing a trailer and having a two wheel drive ute, Matt stormed into the river first without even a second thought. And unbelievably, he got stuck. Nice one, Matt. F***ing idiot. It won't back up. You're not getting out, mate. That's a piece of right. So, as logic would dictate, we sent the other two-wheel drive ute in to tow him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, two-wheel drives can do it, mate. No, 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 no. Not the L200, the Hilux. The L200. <laughs> I'm not going to be pulled out by the L200. Mate, the L200. <laughs> I'll never hear the So, we'll pull Matt through. Yeah, no, I'll never hear the f***ing yeah. And that went about as well as you might expect. While they were busy trying a new style of towing where you don't have the tow rope attached, Lenny, in his Hilux, which has something called four wheel drive, towed the van through without getting stuck once. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, up Struggle Street. Just to make sure that it didn't work, they had another crack at it with the tow rope disconnected. <laughs> There's Dumb and Dumber towing each other through the river. <laughs> oh, here's the clutch. Miraculously, after all of that, the little L200 looked like it was going to pull the big Holden out of the river. Until Matt put the brakes on. Kick on. <laughs> I bet he gets stuck again for real. Yeah, he will. Predictably. Oh, I'm actually stuck. <laughs> I was holding the brake on. <laughs> And after just 45 minutes, David pulled Goliath out of the river. Easy as that, boys. <laughs> <laughs> At long last, we had reached our destination. Yeah, piss bowl through that. Yeah, it wasn't too difficult, was it? <laughs> At the end of the day, you don't really need a Hilux, you just need a L200. So we geared up for a bit of a montage. I was born in the 80s with that summertime love, then changed the whole game like what have I done? At the gutter I come to touch the bright sun, and from the highest heights, mother of oh, I jump. Free in the sky of belief, I can fly, ain't no telling what they're selling, man, they're sheep in disguise. Keep this in mind, I keep on my grind. I can do it anywhere I wanna do it, and bitch, I'll sleep when I die. Get up, get down that showbiz, power to the people that have freedom in their
they spoon feed But I won't be taking that sedative Cause my thoughts are way too precious to waste on the negative I keep them critical yet positive to break the chains Every dawn is a new chance to make a change Think about all the energy swirling all around us We reject it, we get objective, this is what's found stuff Earth is my God and I grew from it I make the youth homage cause I know their views honest Can you read between the lines of the news comments? Fighting on the land just to take some fuel from it I guess all your boils down to some cool profits So who I want is it good for? Really who wants it? Like, who are you to tell me how to live my life? Cause I won't give this up These are my shoes, my view, my cue Day two, adventure time. We're doing it. Yeah. Try and save battery. So it's running now, is it? Yeah. Man, this is gonna be good. Hopefully. It was gonna be good. We were headed down the coast to find a lighthouse we've been told about, which sounds simple enough, but as you're about to find out, it was anything but. What's the plan, Stan? Hit it. <laughs> One of these guys first, I reckon. Oi, she, she was taking some of the back way. Oh yeah, I know the way you mean. Find it. We'll go over, okay. Deciding the first river we came to was too deep to cross at the mouth, we headed inland in search of an easier route and left Kynan to, um, whatever it was he was doing. And despite the fact that there was a perfectly good farm road 50 metres to my left, I decided to go as the crow flies, which nearly went wrong. And then it did go wrong for Kynan. The estuary was shallower to be sure, but we'd have to cross about four different waterways to get to the other side of the river. That's, that looks a bit better. Yeah, it feels pretty hard. You want to go through? Let kind and go. <laughs> Let kind and go. Go on mate, hit it, hit it. Kind of had claimed earlier, and I quote, I'll send all of the rivers first. So we were just holding him to his word. After some clearly very careful navigation of the sand bottom labyrinth, we decided to buy this flounder net would be the best place to cross the final, deepest and widest waterway. I'll go through with you. It looks better here than over there. Yeah. But we'd have to be careful not to get tangled up in it. All of us except for Lenny, who rode straight through it at full throttle. Some well deserved unwrapping of his back wheel, chain and sprockets awaited him. What a moron. Last up was Kynan, and he hadn't seen us walk our bikes through, so just assumed we'd ridden them. And the KDM took water on board. 
a bit deep for the old girl. <laughs> but yeah, she's deep. Can you get it going or? Nah. Too much water in the car. Happily, however, it appeared that Kynan was well versed in this sort of dilemma, so he had the KDM back up and running in no time, and we hit the track again. <laughs> Show our ways over there. The second river we came to, rather worryingly, was supposed to be the harder of the two to cross. But it turned out to be a bit of a doddle, and before long we were safely across the other side without even a single cock up. Where the going got a bit tougher, but also mesmerizingly beautiful. found the lighthouse, where we thought, why not just keep going? So we did. Beautiful is this place, honestly. After exploring what was surely one of the most beautiful places on earth, it was time to head back before the tide trapped us there, so we started to make our way. But before long, we realised something was missing. Scary time for us, Don't know where old Jack's gone. As it panned out, he hadn't finished exploring. Yeah, like to where that slip is, like just oh. below that. Um, and yeah, we did a hill climb and then we come back, but he's, I don't know. I'm a bit 
worried he's broken down. That'd be a cock up. Yeah, well, we're going to play rugby tonight. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cheers. <laughs> Kynan and I resorted to tracking him, which isn't a particularly difficult thing to do in sand, so before long we were on his heels. Curious George located, we headed back up the coast to rendezvous with the group, who were on this side of the second river trying to fix the big quad which had broken down. God, f well, that one. Yeah. Lenny tried to fix it, but couldn't seem to find the fault, despite me and Jack doing everything in our power to help out. So he admitted defeat, put it back together, and it started working. then immediately broke down again in the middle of the river. And then we'll hook up both two bikes and we'll pull it through. What about old mate over here? Lift it up again, Jack. Jesus! Matt, grab the rope. Pull it out more than that. For some reason, they then sent him on his way. Still going right? Nah, yeah. oi, get them to tow it back to the Get them to tow it all the way. This put me into David Hasselhoff mode. We still had the other much deeper and softer river to get that quad through before the tide came in, so my pedanticness wasn't without cause. Hang on, I think that was a bit stupid of them to say that. I reckon they are going to need that thing towed all the way back to the Terramawiwi. Um, what, oh, is it not running? I don't reckon it's going to run again. It, it broke down, started running again, it's broken down again, we've got no idea what the issue is. It's got air, it's got fuel, it's got... Okay. Well, we'll just tow it on and we'll just... We've got hit. No, we can do it. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, that was dumb of them to, to wave right. you off like that. No, that's cool. Um, yeah, cheers. Right, we'll spin around and go and Yeah, thanks so much, mate. They're going to tow you all the way back. Alright, mate. Awesome, thanks so much. You'll be right. You'll be fine. Lenny! I think the battery's Yeah. So the KTM had a flat battery, the big quad was dead, and the little one had no brakes. But we weren't going to let any of that dampen our spirits, it was all part of the adventure. Next up, it was the YZ's turn to go a bit wrong. Oh, she's taken on! This, and the Kawasaki going straight through without missing a beat, made Lenny very cross. Thankfully though, the YZ decided to fix itself, and even Kynan's KTM got through this one without drowning. 
Now I'm wet. <laughs> Things were looking up, but then they got a lot worse. Lenny and I sprung into action, but unfortunately we're not very intelligent, so we ran to push the quad, which had been disconnected by this point. Push the quad, Lenny. Oh. One quad bike wasn't going to cut it, so we tried two. Get out. Yeah. Our last hope was the winch. Success at last. Well done. I'm good. <laughs> Crisis averted. We sent the Can Am through on its own. What a beast. Then, using physics that don't fully make sense to me, the Honda Farm Quad towed the dead grizzly through like it was nothing. In a case all of that wasn't bizarre enough, what you're about to witness was probably the weirdest 10 minutes of my entire life. First of all the little quad stormed into the river and died immediately, but the boys were able to pull that out no problem. Then some people on trikes showed up and demonstrated some advanced river crossing techniques. After that a four wheel drive careered through the river with its door open. Then another one followed it at the speed of sound. While all of this was going on, somebody was skimboarding behind their car in the ocean. And to top it all off, Kevin Hart then started towing Shaquille O'Neal back to camp, but inevitably ran out of steam before long, so we towed it the rest of the way with the Hilux, where Matt jumped on the opportunity to show off his Tokyo drifting skills. Finally after all of that, we arrived back at the camp safe and sound to find that Jack's ute had decided to have a flat tyre. Oh, it's only flat at the bottom. Yeah, good point, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. All in all, a pretty good day. The next morning after a not so quiet night, we cleaned up after ourselves, packed the vehicles, loaded the bikes, and called it a wrap on the first episode of Full Throttle. I hope you enjoyed. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I just wanted to jump in here at the end for those of you that are interested and basically explain what this is, how it came to be and whether or not you'll see more, etc. So basically, late last year I was watching TV and I was thinking, this is boring as hell, I can make something better than this. So that was all it took and I was on my way. I set about coming up with the best hour of entertainment I possibly could based on what you guys have liked over the years here on YouTube. 
and compiling it all into the, you know the ultimate hour of entertainment of motocross based entertainment because that's of course what this channel is based on and um, that was exactly what I did and, and the intention was to then send it around to various TV production companies and channels and that kind of thing and, and essentially see if anybody was interested if they were great I was really hoping they would be because you know I knew it was going to be good and if they weren't well then I made a TV pilot age 20 but it would be a cool keepsake I was basically sending around each little bit as and when I finished it, you know, the first film, the second film, the intro, that kind of thing. And before I was even a, probably a quarter of the way through, a uh, TV production company here in New Zealand was game to do a full season. So my ambition was justified pretty quickly. But they wanted to change a few things. They wanted to do half hour episodes and change the format up a bit, that kind of thing. It was all fine. But I went ahead and finished the pilot as I'd envisioned it. Um, because you know I wanted to realize that vision as, as like a personal thing and this is basically what I ended up coming up with and I'm pretty proud of it and that was in February that I finished this and it's just basically been sitting on my computer since then collecting dust while the show's been in pre-production the reason the show is taking so long is because it's going to be a sponsor funded show so the production company and all that are currently going around gathering up sponsorship before we can begin shooting but I stumbled across it the other day and watched through it again for the first time in ages and I thought, man, this is so cool. What's it doing just sitting here doing nothing on my computer? It, you know, it needs to, I wish I could show you guys, I, you know, I, I knew you'd love it. For no other reason than it was based on what you guys have loved in the past the most. You know, it's supposed to be ultimate versions of what you guys have most liked over the years on the channel. So I messaged my producer and I said, look, the show is going to be way different to this that you know it's going to be half hour episodes this is going to get chopped up and moved around and there's a whole lot of health and safety issues in there that are going to get cut before the final show and that kind of thing so why can't i just post this original pilot up based on the fact that it's going to look nothing like the finished show that way if nothing else at least it gets a little bit of hype and attention going for the show you know before we actually shoot it but what i was really hoping to do is show you guys because i knew you guys would love it even more than i do so um to my surprise he basically said yeah that's yeah let's do that it's um you know it's no use just sitting there let's post it up get a bit of hype going and um he said you know basically send me the link let's see how it goes so that's the reason you guys are seeing this after like eight months of sitting on my hard drive being finished collecting dust as i said um, yeah, you guys get to see the original, original pilot as I envisioned it, as I wrote it, you know, as I got my mates together and made it happen. And, you know, this was all with essentially no money. So you can imagine what the actual show is going to be like. It's going to be like this, except on a whole nother level, basically. So what you're seeing here will make the final show, most of it. It'll just be, as I said, chopped up and moved around. There'll be a lot of things cut, probably some song changes. I'm not sure whether or not we'll be able to license all those songs, all that kind of thing. Yeah, anyway, until then, I hope you enjoy this. I'm going to keep posting as many YouTube videos as I can before we get into, into the swing of things on shooting the show. Um, so obviously stick around for those. Subscribe if you haven't already. And um, yeah, keep an eye and an ear out for full throttle. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the future. Cheers.